host, Jose Luis Jimenez. Ben Mendez. I'm Greg Compian. Today we're going to discuss something that's really important. Actually, I don't know if it's important or not, but it's a reality in our community. That we're going to talk about being pocho in the United States of America. If you don't know what being pocho means, we're going to learn it today, okay? But before we get into the topic, let's talk about what's going on out there. Ben? The hot topic, uh, the immigration policy by Obama. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is a big win for the dreamers. What do you all think? I tell you what, I think it's monumental. And I think that uh, the community, we need to really get behind the president and uh, make sure that the Republicans don't have an opportunity to turn this, being Romney appealing it. Now, do you think this was politically motivated? We got elections coming up. I think it is. I think it's completely politically motivated. But you know what? One step forward, let's take it. You know, there are a lot of children out there that, that you know, fall to their own, you know, are in this situation. But I think that's something we're going to talk about today, too. And I think mix, it mixes in really good what we're talking about. You know, culture, community, identification. It's all part of this. And, you know, those children that came here, they're going to school, they're graduating, they're being in the military, they're doing everything that you're supposed to do and be part of the society. Let's give them the opportunity to earn it. You know, a lot of people didn't realize that even if you're in the military, that does not mean automatically that you're going to be a citizen. Mm -hmm. So this is a great move by the president. Ben, your point earlier was it politically motivated. E everything's politically motivated. When you pump gas in your car, that's politically motivated. So I don't think it is political. I think it's about time. So uh, uh, I, I take my hat off to the president, having the courage just to throw out that right hook no one saw coming. Well, I, I, I agree with you, and I also disagree, because I think he could have done this right when he came in. He's, he's been sitting there for, for a few years, and he waited until all of a sudden we get to the end, and we've got to see where the Latino vote is at, we got to see where this is going to end up. I'm, I'm glad he took a stand. I'm very, I'm very happy he did, because it, it takes a lot of courage to do something like that. But look at the timing. Let's just be real. I mean, he could have done this three months into election, not three months But he had no out. support from the Congress. Could he still doesn't have any Congress. support. Well, I mean, he made a presidential, but I, still. I agree. We're on the same page there, yeah. but, you know, we'll see. We're going to have a lot of discussion <laughs> on that. The, as you all heard, or maybe you haven't heard, about an hour and a half ago, uh, Roger Clemens was found innocent, dropped all charges against him. Now, about two years ago, we were on this show <laughs> debating this very issue, and I say he's guilty, and today I still say he's guilty. Well, a jury of your peers say he's not, so get over it. He's Drop guilty. It. Let it go. It's done. That's what happens when you have money. Uh, you're able to get away with things like this. Well, the, the money might have <laughs> been made him a, a target also, Ben. He could have just probably told the truth from the get going. But uh, there's a whole lot more topics than to be beating up Roger Clemens for telling a little fib. Big deal. Like you've never lied before. True. I, I have I have <laughs> lied. <laughs> I have lied before. Uh, Chad Holly was uh -huh. arrested again for breaking and entering. As you all know, uh, he was in the middle of all that mess when the police officers were beating him up and the police officers were not indicted. Mm -hmm. Or actually, they were indicted, but one of them was not convicted. Mm -hmm. One got scot free. Now, my opinion is that Chad Holly needs to go to jail. Okay? Uh, for one, he, he has done it more than once. Mm -hmm. Okay? So let's put him in jail. What do you say? Well, um, quit making excuses. Uh... Uh, look at the lives that have been affected. Look at the people that supported, got behind him, and then basically to slap him in the face like that. Well, we're uh, talking about two different things here. One thing is we're talking about him being a criminal. Okay, if he's breaking and entering, he needs to do his, his, do his punishment. And we're also talking about the way police officers reacted. Okay, I am extremely pro-police, and I also know the training that's going on. And whenever you go to court and you go to the situation, and you have your own trainer saying that you used excessive force, then we have to look at that. That's a different situation. We're talking about two different things. He's guilty for doing what he's doing. You know, we're going to find him guilty. But at the same time, did the police overreact and did they use too much force? You know, policy says they did. The jury said they didn't. But his credibility is shot. No, absolutely. It's I, done. I mean, it's just a, really it, now it's just. If you do the crime, you do the time. Absolutely. Now, Jack Cagle, commissioner from Precinct 4, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're aware of this, but he is not allowing piñatas at any of his parks anymore. <laughs> <laughs> in his defense, as soon as those signs were already up in place many years before he became uh, commissioner, so you got to blame the one before him. Okay, so not that I'm defending Jack Cagle. He seems like a nice guy. I haven't met him yet, but... 
They've been in place for over six years now. Could they have done it differently? Absolutely. Could have just said no loitering or no no littering, whatever the case is, but not no piñatas. <laughs> Golly. Uh, Rodney King was found dead this weekend. Now, you all know the riots in L.A. caused some big chaos over there. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about that? Well, I think that that case sparked a lot of the civil rights movements that happened in the early 90s. I mean, that changed the way LAPD worked with the city and the community. So, uh, you know, he was a symbol of civil rights, but at the same time, he had a hard life. You know, he's still a human being. You know, so, you know, rest in peace. Yeah, rest in peace. Rest in peace. Last item. Happy Father's Day for all the fathers. Uh, Sunday, I hope you had a good day. Uh, did you all have a, a party? Did you all have a good time on Father's oh, Day? Oh, man, we went to Galveston and barbecued and man, rode down the seawall, went to uh, <laughs> the Pleasure Pier. I thought it was different when they told me mm -hmm. I was going to the Pleasure Pier, but there was a lot of rides there. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, let's move on to the next topic here. Okay. So, Pleasure Pier in Galveston, Texas, okay? <laughs> they, they lied to me, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, well... This is the beauty of live television. <laughs> now we're going to take a quick break, maybe 30 seconds, and we're going to come back and talk about being pocho in the United States of America. If you don't know what that means, you're going to find out now. We'll be right back. <music> you're watching Latino Talk TV and the beauty of live television. Uh, we're now going to talk about being pocho in, in the United States of America. And in a few minutes, we're going to put the telephone number on the screen. We want you to chime in. Okay, we want you to call in. If you have a position on this, please do it, okay? So our first guest is Professor Lorenzo Cano from the University of Houston. Welcome. Uh, thank you. And we also have Janelle Robles, and we also have Carlos Duarte. Uh, and what we're going to do right now is we're going to pass it on to each one of y'all, and I would love to, for y'all to describe what y'all do and your position on what being pocho means. Professor? Well, I'm Lorenzo Cano. Uh, I teach at the University of Houston. Uh, my official... Uh, title is as, uh, Associate uh, Director at the Center for Mexican-American Studies. Uh, when they, when they, they brought out the topic of, of pocho, you know, I, I kind of laughed because I, I figured this would be a little tongue-in-cheek. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there could be a lot of seriousness in this whole idea concept of pocho uh, because uh, the term pocho or being a pocho usually is discussed within the context of Mexican-Americans, uh, for example, being within the context of a Mexican audience either because Mexican-Americans go to, to Mexico and they don't, may not speak Spanish as well as uh, many people in Mexico, or in the, the same way, uh, or within the context of being in an environment of, um, or, or home where a lot of people from Mexico are and you happen to be Mexican-American. Uh, so that, it's usually within that context, uh, but uh, I guess uh, to look at it historically, uh, pocho uh, usually is a derogatory, uh, derogatory term. Uh, it doesn't always have to be. Uh, but it's, it's because of migration, it's because of uh, oftentimes uh, people of Mexican descent were placed in secondary positions, uh, for example, in terms of public schools. Uh, they didn't receive adequate schooling. Uh, certainly, uh, they were not taught Spanish, even though they came in the, uh, already many times speaking Spanish uh, in kindergarten or in the first grade. So maybe they evolved <laughs> into, into becoming a pocho in the sense that maybe they forgot the the Spanish language. Uh, so it's uh, being Americanized uh, for the most part, and I think many Mexican-Americans are, uh, and, um, but I think uh, the Chicano movement and other efforts by a lot of contemporary leaders are asking people to regain your Mexicanness, learn to speak Spanish, and, and learn about your history, and these kinds of things that we do at the university. Ben, hmm. you know? Um, yeah, so my name is Janelle Robles. I work with the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition. I'm just basically an immigrant rights activist here in Houston. Um, so my impression of the word pocho, I don't think that my generation really uses it that much. And But when I did hear it, um, it was usually used in a derogatory way, and I think it was used to describe someone who was not uh, fluent in Spanish or, you know, kind of went back and forth with the Spanglish. Um, and, and, and was maybe a little bit more assimilated kind of thing. So, so yeah, that's just kind of my overall impression of the word. Okay. 
Yeah, so my name is Carlos Duarte, and I can tell you that both my father and my father-in-law would be having a heart attack right now if they knew that I was sitting at a discussion <laughs> about being bocho or not. Uh, you know, they, they always have a hard time when, when they realize that my kids don't speak perfect Spanish, and they would always be advocates for, you know, you're Mexican, you got to be perfect in your Spanish, you got to know your history, you got to know your tradition and whatnot. Uh, so even though I migrated from Mexico 16 years ago, uh, my whole family comes from El Paso, Texas, from my father's side. And we would visit them often, and I would see how they would struggle to try and keep their Spanish. So to me, I have a lot of respect uh, for people that were used to, call, to, be, to be called pochos, because I saw the effort that it took for them to try to be players both in the United States in an English-speaking world, and also with their cousins that would bring, give them a hard time because they wouldn't speak perfect Spanish or they, didn't, they wouldn't even know who Miguel Hidalgo was or you know, stuff from Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think, you know, going to Professor Cano's point, you know, the, the pride of your Mexican heritage or your Latino heritage, now that we become much more um, diverse, uh, I think it's crucial to, to regain that. And I think that it's absurd, all, all of these discussions about not being bilingual, you know, where in countries in Europe people speak three, four, five languages. Uh, the fact that we are even discussing that we shouldn't have a second language, Spanish, that it's so close to home, it's, it's just absurd. So, so my, my thing is, you know, how do we regain uh, our culture, our tradition, and push forward so that we become even better or, uh, contributors to this, to this country? Well, I'm just honored that we have Lorenzo Cano mm -hmm. here on stage with us. Uh, you're my former professor That's at correct. The college. Uh, that was about five years ago when I graduated. <laughs> about 20 years ago. <laughs> five years ago. Uh, but I tell you what, uh, the demographics at U of H say it all. You know, uh, we look at U of H as a whole. I'm talking about U of H downtown and U of H central and Clear Lake. Uh, you, and you see the demographics change. Uh, as a result of that change, what do you see amongst the Hispanics? Are they taking more Spanish courses uh, more Mexican-American courses? Uh, what kind of courses are they taking nowadays? Well, uh, I think they're taking all kinds of courses. It's all of the above. Uh, Mexican-American and Latino students at U of H, especially those who are from the United States, are taking all kinds of courses. And it, it fairly, uh, it, it pretty much fits a pattern of what students generally are taking. Uh, for example, there are a lot of students in, in the College of Business. So you, obviously you have a lot of Mexican-Americans in the College of Business. Uh, but there is a concerted effort among the students to take more courses uh, like this. Cultural-based exactly. courses. Exactly. Uh, and do you see an increase in funding or decrease? Is the college really supporting your program? Well, uh, we, we have not confronted too much opposition if you're referring to the Center for Mexican-American Studies. Uh, we have had to, uh, to build what we've been able to build up to this point. And uh, I think we've been quite successful, and we continue raising funds for students for scholarships. And of course, we continue offering classes uh, mm -hmm. at the university. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, the success of what we were able to do and what students were able to do when they established this program, going back almost 40 years now, mm -hmm. uh, gave us a strong foundation. Uh, and the university, I think that uh, perhaps initially, uh, looked the other way, didn't give us too much importance, but as time moved on, they realized that a lot of the Anglo students were not graduating at the time that they were supposed to, and there was actually a significant Anglo dropout rate from the University of Houston. Uh, and then they came back and they, they, they spoke with us, and they said, well, how do you guys do it? Because you guys have all these kinds of programs to retain students and to try to graduate students. So I think over the years, uh, they've learned to work with us, and they realized that the kind of work that we did within the the Mexican-American community and the Latino community also could put it, be put in place to help students generally. Uh, so I feel good at that point. The, the area where we do need uh, more support is in hiring additional numbers of Mexican-American uh, faculty. And that's the area that we need to work on in the next few years. Yeah, I think that it's very important as our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents had the vision to come over to this country for a better opportunity and we're the recipients of that and our kids and what have you, but, but maintaining that, that integrity of, of the history and the culture and what have you, uh, you know, that might have got a little skewed because, you know, as you well know, uh, Professor Cano, mm -hmm. that, you know, young kids 40 years ago in school, if you spoke Spanish, you know, you were disciplined and they were in separate classes and what have you. So uh, seeing the young lady here and what she stands for and what she does is just awesome. Thank you.
you. I, I totally agree. I wanted to bring up the same point that I think maybe um, kind of like, you know, they were raised to be, you know, to not speak. You know, they got a slap on the hand if they spoke Spanish in school. Um, my mother, when she went to elementary school, she got a slap on the hand if she spoke Spanish. Um, so, so kind of obviously growing up that way makes you somewhat, you know, not fluent in Spanish and kind of uh, pocho-ish. <laughs> so, you know, speaking of that, I mean, it's like, so today, should families make a concerted effort to maintain Spanish in the household? Should it and why? If you don't agree, I mean, or should it be taught in the schools? Do, should, should your tax dollars be used to educate you know, in two languages. Well, I, I just heard what the, the uh, Houston, uh, the HISD uh, has a Chinese school, right? So, so suddenly it, everything can be taught in Chinese, so people can learn Chinese and English and mm -hmm. not Spanish and English. So I, I would be an advocate uh, to have Spanish being taught at the, at the school. Uh, it is part of our culture, it is part of our tradition, so we should be able to take advantage of that and have the institutions to support that effort. Just for our viewers' uh, information, uh there are dual language programs out there that teach Spanish and English. Unfortunately, in our community, there's not very many. If there was a need or if more people would register for those courses, then we would have more opportunities. More schools will take on the challenge of having dual language programs. So uh, we are partly to blame for the success or not non-success, if you will, in our community of the dual language programs. Okay, so what's the position? Well, we need more dual language programs, but we also need the support of parents to put their kids into those programs. Uh, we had a dual language program right here in Mason Park area, and they couldn't get enough students. Mason Park, as you all know, about 90, 95% are Latino in that area, mm -hmm. and yet we could not get enough students to participate in that program. Well, and I think that one of the problems is that people think, you know, we're in the United States, people should speak English, and, and especially, you know, for immigrants, they're coming in and they're saying, you know what, the, the priority is to learn English. Well, guess what? You know, Spanish has been spoken in the United States from the very beginning, you know, if, if you consider uh, Texas, California. So Spanish has been a language in the United States, and, and we need to recognize that. So our community needs to understand that it does make people... Uh, smarter, uh, have to have the ability to be part of two different cultures. A, a, a vast number of people in the, in, the, in the world speak Spanish. So why not take advantage of that opportunity, you know, to, to create that in our own culture, in our own communities, to learn that, that Spanish that some other people would love to have. You know, you go to Europe and they are uh, excited about learning about different cultures, about Mexico, about uh, El Salvador, about all of these countries. And we have it here and we are just closing our eyes and saying, no, we don't want that. We only want to speak English or we only want to know about the culture in the United States. So I, I think we're missing the boat here. We have a huge resource. We need to take advantage of it. If I can add, uh, Spanish should not be seen as a foreign language. Uh, Spanish, as you mentioned, historically has uh, predated English in this part of the country and in many other sections. All of the mountain ranges and rivers that have Spanish uh, surname, language names uh, to them, uh, it should be just taught as an additional language. But uh, I think we're with more migration and with a better understanding of our history, we're realizing that oftentimes we say things uh, that are not correct. Uh, Spanish should be taught as well as English and probably in our communities we should come out uh, multilingual not only bilingual uh, and uh, these, these are the challenges for also white middle class uh, society mm -hmm. you know they should uh, you know uh, step up and uh, come out as you, you uh, said and, and learn Spanish as well as many other languages mm -hmm. as they can by the time they get out of high school. Mm -hmm. I think there's that fear factor though and you touched on it about people wanting to not pronunciate properly and what have you, so what they'll shy away from it rather than miss, miss say it but be, be corrected on it and then improve from it. And, and I think that's probably where the disconnect lies. Hmm. So, yeah, you know, that, that's a good point. Um, my kids, they speak English for the most part. And every once in a while I'll hear them speak in Spanish, but they won't speak to, in Spanish to me. They'll speak it to someone that doesn't speak English. So I know they know a little bit of Spanish, but they're not forced to use that. And somehow we need to figure out a way for the kids to feel comfortable in speaking Spanish. So I got a question. So, uh, yes, I think children should speak Spanish. Do I practice it at home? I wish I practiced more. But now I'm going to take it. I'm going to touch something different. We're right in the middle of the whole immigrants' rights conversation. So, speaking of immigration, which immigrant has a better chance of staying? The one that speaks English? or speaks both languages or Spanish only? 
But if all things are equal, <laughs> let's be real. Yeah, if all things are equal, <laughs> uh, probably more than likely that individual that speaks English uh, will have a better chance. Um, but again, you know, each uh, the, the laws are very, very interesting. Uh, every every case is very unique, and that's mm -hmm. why I said if all things being equal, uh, I would imagine. You know, this case that, or actually this policy uh, by Obama, uh, really affects the universities. Uh, I predict, I mean, uh, I think many have predicted also is that we're going to have an increase of number of graduates, not only from high school, uh, but from the college. And it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next four or five years if that actually happens. Um, you know, we have a high dropout rate. Anything that helps the dropout rate is a plus. And I congratulate Obama and his staff and whoever put this legislation or this policy together. Uh, kudos to them. You know, you, you, you say Obama, but it's President Obama. President that, Obama. Get it right. That, that kind of gets missed a lot. <laughs> and, and, and you're absolutely right. But what happens is that uh, uh, you touched on it earlier. You said, is it political? Everything's political. Mm -hmm. You got the state representative from the Woodlands and other people trying to make uh, English only and what have you. So it is, everything's about politics. But I think that we have a responsibility as parents mm -hmm. to continue that here. And you can't depend on the schools to do everything or the universities. Start at the house. Okay. So do you think that everyone, I think we're talking about, we got to talk about two different things. Being a butcher brings also the, the, the being multicultural. Like you're no longer multicultural. You might live in both worlds, but your Spanish is terrible, but you think you're more American, or some people call it being white, or being more American, whatever the term you want to call it. And on the other side, if you're, you're also a butcher when you're too Mexican. You know, there's all kinds of things. So being multicultural is different from being bilingual. Yes or no? I mean, it's, what do you all think about that? Well, I, I think that you're touching on a, an important point in terms of the identity of the United States and the whole notion of the melting pot and we need to be homogeneous and we all need to look alike. I think we're moving, especially in a city like Houston, the most diverse city in the country, where, we, where it's actually an asset to be different, to have your own identity. And I think that we need to, need to move from a uh, policy of tolerance, where I tolerate you if you're different from me, to a, to a policy where we actually take advantage of that difference. What is it that you, as a Chinese, as a Vietnamese, uh, can teach me, and what is it that I, as a Latino, Mexican-American or Mexican immigrant, can teach you? So, so I think we need to move in, 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 in that direction. Uh, you know, having said that, I think going back to your point as to, and, and I want to twist it a little bit, who would be more, more successful uh, staying here, someone that speaks English, someone that's, that, that only speaks Spanish. You know, one of the realities on how our society has been evolving is that there are these pockets, and, and it, some people would love to hear me say this, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it. There are certain pockets where you can actually be, be successful just speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, so so a, a sort of segregation has continued to happen. And again, going back to the point, if we are a multicultural society, we need to start building those bridges uh, and, and allow all, all of us to really take advantage of all that, that diversity that can make us a better place. Mm -hmm. That's the fear of the unknown. That's the biggest fear, right? Well, yeah, that's why we organized um, an umpteen number of trips for, for Mexican-American students to go to Mexico to kind of reconnect and, and to uh, you know, reconnect to our roots and the language and, and also to know what's going on. We have presidential elections coming up. Uh, so everything from language and history and literature, mm -hmm. I think it's important for Mexican-Americans uh, to reconnect. And I think uh, we should be reminded that the vast majority of the people in Mexico speak Spanish, but there are about 28 other languages that are really authentic Mexican languages. That's the indigenous languages in Mexico. In many ways, when you want to look at it, the people in Mexico lost their indigenous languages from Nahuatl to ver the various categories of Maya language and Totonaco and many of the others that the Chatinos speak in Oaxaca and other places. And when you talk to them, they'll say, well, this is the authentic, uh, one of several authentic Mexican languages. So uh, who's calling who a pocho, see? Yeah. And that's why I said in tongue in cheek, we have to know our history because history will teach us and make us uh, and clarify the contemporary uh, status and conditions of people everywhere. Mm -hmm. so. so Janelle, what's your position on this? Um, well, I mean, I, I'm thinking more about like the pocho in terms of the undocumented youth and how I've met so many of them who are so fluent in English and, you know, I try to, sometimes I've, I've tried to have conversations with them in Spanish and it's like, you know, they mess up a couple words and I'm like, whoa, you <laughs> so it's kind of like an oxymoron there and, and it totally, you know, 
Um, and and that's part of their movement too. That you know, like, hey, we're here. We're here to stay. Um, we're fully integrated into American culture and American society. And and why are we not being given this opportunity mm -hmm. to be recognized as full American citizens? So so what you know, I think you touched on a really good point there. Is when you're having a conversation, when I mean, you go to the grocery store and you see somebody that looks more Mexican than you, and you know, and you start talking to them in Spanish, and then they can't speak a word of Spanish, and well, I mean, like a pocho. You know, you throw stuff out like that. You, you kind of you say that, but what's the what's the connotation? What, why do we come with that position? I mean, have you all ever done that? I mean, it's, it's, let's just be honest. It's prejudice. Even amongst really amongst is. Latinos, there's prejudice amongst Latinos. Well, and I think that's that's the unspoken secret that everybody knows, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of racism within within the Latino community. There's all of these divisions, right? I was born here. No, you migrated. No, you're from South America. No, you're from South Mexico. So we we do need to recognize that. But I, you know, I want to go back to what you were saying. It, we need to to have as parents. Uh, the determination to teach her, our children to, to speak Spanish because it's really difficult. Uh, my oldest daughter, when she starts speaking to me in English and, and I want her to really get the point, I would turn to English so that I speak to her in English so that I'm sure that she's getting it. Not that she would obey me or anything, right? But still, you know, <laughs> that she would get the point. It's you know, kind of like, oh, go ahead. I, I consider myself a late bloomer. Uh, I was born in, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And the, back in those days, there wasn't a whole lot of Latinos in that community. Mm. There was no TV there. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not that far back. How did you end up in Fort Wayne, Indiana? I mean, seriously. Well, that's where my family ended up. They used to pick the crops uh, up go. north. Oh. Migrant workers. Yeah, migrant workers. And so uh, I ended up staying in Fort Wayne, Indiana until probably the third grade. And as a result, I didn't learn Spanish. And it wasn't until that I moved to McAllen, Texas, where probably half, half of the people there spoke nothing but Spanish, you know, and so it was a cultural shock for me uh, in, in moving into that environment. But I thought it was the best thing that could have happened to me because I was able to learn a little bit of Spanish. I don't consider myself a great a Spanish speaker, uh, but I can get by in conversation. And, and, and I thank my parents also because they really pushed us to, to speak Spanish in, in McAllen. Uh, ironically, up north, uh, my parents did not push me to speak Spanish. But once you're amongst family, your grandparents and your tias and your tios, and it's a, it's almost a, you have to speak Spanish because your grandparents cannot communicate with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I I was just going to add to that. I think he makes a really good point. I mean, you have to speak Spanish if you want to continue communicating with your very own community and with your elders, right? And I think that's kind of why I continue to keep the Spanish even though I wasn't required to. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to add on that. I, I was just going to uh, say something about the school. So a lot of times in, in bilingual education and, and whatnot, once you learn English, then they stop the Spanish. And I suggest, I'm suggesting that we need to improve our Spanish, even young Spanish-speaking kids as they go through the public school system. Uh, you know, and why not take courses in chemistry in Spanish? And you know, why not take the health classes in Spanish, as well as in English, you know, and perhaps others, uh, in order to really facilitate the, the, the development of the Spanish language so that once you graduate, you'll be as good as any other person graduating from Spain or Latin America, anywhere, see? And don't take, a, don't take what we have, you know, fertilize it and let us get even better in our Spanish, as well as our English. You just reminded me of something. Uh, I used to be a teacher at Austin High School, and I used to teach math. <laughs> <laughs> and most of my students uh, were ESL students, literally. And I was the only teacher at Austin High School that taught math in Spanish. Uh, and there is no ESL math. It's, it's, you don't hear that. Uh, but ironically, I taught math in Spanish. So it, it was a learning experience. Uh, I thought the students really appreciated it because after a while, they, they had to learn English as well, mm -hmm. the terminology. Uh, but it really helped them advance. Yeah, I, I think what happens, so, it, you know, with, like, kids also, you know, someone says something wrong and they laugh at them or what have you, so you got to get past that and kind of really kind of build on it, and, and the only way you're going to do it is at home. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to take a quick break in a little bit, about five minutes or so, but I want to kind of wrap it up for the second half. Is it or is it not necessary to be bilingual in the United States to be successful? And definition of successful is different for everybody. But in y'all's opinion, should you or should you not? Could you or could you not? Do you need to be bilingual? Can you do it Spanish only? Can you do it English only? And what does it mean with the culture? 
Well, you know, success is measured in so many different ter uh, ways and, mm -hmm. and, and, and manners. You know, someone who's successful in one way did it a way someone else, someone else may choose not to do so. But I think uh, the, the, the reality is, is the, the more languages that you speak, the more knowledge that you have in any area uh, is going to put you in the position so that you will potentially be able to be much more successful in however you define success, whether that's uh, success uh, with your family, success in your employment, success in your community. Uh, and, and so that uh, when you're uh, a ripe old age and you're reflecting back, you'll feel content to yourself, you know, in your heart that in fact I was successful, uh, whether or not I did, I, I was a millionaire or not or whatever, but I was successful uh, and, and, and because someone may choose to define it as such. So mm -hmm. I think the idea is to allow us to grow intellectually and, and embrace as much as we can mm -hmm. so that our success will be uh, potentially more successful. You know, Jose, I think one of the deals that kind of we, we disconnect on also is that I think we have a responsibility to do more mentoring. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very important. And I think that success, you touch on it all different areas and what have you. But you, we really, really have a, 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 a obligation that, I mean, and I think we would probably get more out of it, but that's there's there's some type of a missing link there mm -hmm. to uh, uh, encourage someone who maybe not speak English as well as you, mm -hmm. and, and 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 I think with that being successful, whether you're a minister, you have an obligation to 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 mentor, and I think that's where we're missing a little bit. Well, I think two points. One is that there's a huge market, uh, you know, for, for Spanish speakers, not only Latin America, but also within the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, there's s certain sections uh, in the city uh, where you go and it's really to your advantage that you can make business as if you speak, if you speak uh, Spanish. But I think going back to what the definition of success is, uh, I would say that you're not being successful if you only speak one language. Uh, and, you know, something that really impressed me, I, I had a, a friend in, in Phoenix who was... Uh, from the United States, a, a white white girl, and she, and, you know, she was telling me, Carlos, you know, we, we feel sad that no one in our family has yet gotten a Nobel Prize. So all of them are attorneys, doctors, uh, PhDs, and, and, and they have this high expectation of their own family, uh, you know, to even achieve a Nobel Prize. So, so again, I mean, is, is, it, is it enough to speak English and Spanish? You know, we live in Houston. We should be learning, in addition to those two, Chinese, Vietnamese. So let's be ambitious. Let's not just be content with two languages. I, I agree. I mean, I think the more languages that you know and the more cultures that you're familiar with, um, the more successful, I think, or the more, um, yeah, the more successful that you can be um, just because you can communicate better with people and you have more access to those communities. And... Um, and I think it adds to, to our, um, you know, really embrace that. And, it, and, and it's something that adds to us instead of taking away from us. So if you can learn a new language or if you can really encourage, you know, your, in my case, nieces and nephews um, and my friends to continue to speak Spanish and, in, you know, English and another language or get familiar with other cultures, I think you're adding instead of really subtracting. So. Awesome. Pretty good first half. I think she's going to be signing up for a course at U of H. I think so. <laughs> you teaching it or what? Chinese or what's next? <laughs> French. No. <laughs> you know, when I was growing up, uh, I went to Pershing Middle School. And because I spoke Spanish at home, when I got to Pershing and I was in the Inter International Baccalaureate, the IB program, you know, they had two choices. All my friends were taking French and then there was Spanish. So I wanted to hang out with my friends in sixth, seventh grade and I want to go take French. And I went home and I told my dad, hey, I'm going to take French at Pershing Middle School. Come on, learn another language. He's like, boy, you don't even know how to speak Spanish yet. <laughs> you know, and I thought I spoke Spanish. I mean, it's all I grew up speaking Spanish. So honestly, that was the best thing that could ever happen because from sixth and seventh grade on, I learned the, the actual uh, language itself and the actual, you know, how to write it, how to read it, how to do the actual grammar, how to, you know, study in Spanish. And it was a whole different world for me. Because just because you speak the language doesn't know doesn't mean you know the language, and you know knowing the language is the next part. The second half of the show we're going to get into the business aspect of things. We have the Cámara de Empresarios Latinos, yes, it's in Spanish, and we're going to talk about you know the impact of being bilingual or only speaking one language in business here today. Okay, so we'll be right back. You're watching Latino Talk TV. 
And we're gonna get into the second half of the show and we're gonna now talk about business. Business and being pocho. It actually can happen, okay? So our guests now are Ipolito Acosta, uh, Vice Chair of the Cámara de Empresarios Latinos de Houston. That's correct. All right, that's a nice and short term. Uh, Abel Sanchez, past chair of the Cámara de Empresarios also. And uh, Fidencio. Fidencio. Leja. I'm sorry. I, I, I got a long name, brother, like me. What you got? Fidencio? Leja. Chavez, Jr. There we go, you see? There's <laughs> a true Mexican right there. <laughs> and you're representing the NHPO, National Hispanic Professional Organization. The Leadership Institute. Leadership Institute, which is a very special course that you know, I'm very proud to say I, I was part of class one. And y'all can give me hell about that later. So, okay. <laughs> well, anyways, let's get to it. Uh, Ipolito, uh, you also bring a different perspective to this conversation. What, tell us what you think about being Pocho in America. Well, you know, I, I had the, um, the benefit of growing up as a Pocho myself, you know, in West Texas. Uh, and, 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 I, and I saw it from a perspective that w when we talk about there's individuals that see it as a derogatory term. And quite on the contrary, when we're growing up working in the migrant fields, uh, agriculture fields, uh, we saw young kids that would use Spanglish, if you will, uh, part uh, English, part Spanish, uh, what, what, whatever was needed at the time. So it wasn't seen as a derogatory term. As we grew older and everybody became more conscious of uh, the cultural background, we, uh, you know, I saw that people got offended uh, w with that particular term. So I think it's a perspective of where you come from, how it's used. And as, as I grew in, uh, in, in, in our great country, uh, I then spent 30 years with, with the U.S. government, and, and I served in the diplomatic field. And one of the things that I remember when I went to Mexico City that we would have a press conference and I would represent the, uh, the embassy, and we had a lot of pochos uh, in the diplomatic staff, if you will, uh, American diplomats that uh, were lacking actually in Spanish. And in, in some instances when we talk about is there a need to, to be efficient in, in the language, and there's no doubt that there is. But where, where I'm headed is that I learned to use more appropriate Spanish as I developed in, in that particular field. And I think it was, for me, it was very successful both within uh, our own country and of course in representing my country uh, in Latin America. So I, I think it was important. And now I work very closely with uh, businessmen who are recent arrivals in our country. Uh, and, and I think we still see a lot of that uh, where there's a mixture of English and Spanish that's used in order to succeed. So I've seen it from very different perspectives and uh, uh, I think it's something that we accept in our society where we can easily converse in English and Spanish and overlap when we need to. You know, I find it very interesting that we have two chambers that are, one is Spanish speaking and one is uh, non-Spanish speaking here in Houston. And obviously you're the non-Spanish speaking chamber. Now in your demographics, uh, the businessmen that are in your group, uh, do you find that majority of them speak nothing but Spanish? And if so, what percentage would you guesstimate would that be? Um, I believe our, our, our membership uh, as a whole, almost everybody can, can do very well in English alone. Okay? Even though uh, we as a, as a chamber decided that we want to keep uh, Spanish as our means of communicating, that doesn't mean that our membership doesn't speak English, okay? Uh, I think uh, uh, the majority of our membership, uh, I would say probably 80%, we speak very well English and Spanish. The, you probably have about 20% that still in the process of adapting not only uh, individually in the community, but also on the business uh, uh, community as well. But uh, I think uh, uh, for anyone that has uh, the ability to communicate on both languages is always going to be a plus. And I think uh, you can see uh, the results in our Hispanic business community, how it has flourished in the last uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, you see the, the, the community spending, uh, you know, south, north, west, and east. Uh, and I think uh, one of the, um, the attributes is the ability to, to communicate on both languages. I think there's a comfort <coughs> There, a businessman told me one time, he said, it's, uh, people are comfortable in the language they pray in and the language they count their money in. So I think that, you know, it's just that comfort level. Uh, just to, to confirm what you're saying, it's, it's easier. Uh, you know, I've been in this country 32 years. 
I came in when I was 16 years old, and I started speaking English probably six months after I arrived here, and I still, and a, and a lot of uh, environments, I still feel a lot more comfortable speaking Spanish, mm -hmm. you know, because it's you know it's it's, it's just to your own uh, way of communicating. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the you know when I go to work, I I put my you know my. Uh, uh, Put your head, <laughs> and then I got I got to think and I got to think in uh, in English, you know. I about twelve hundred of my clients. The only reason that I think I'm successful is because they prefer to speak in Spanish, even mm -hmm. though they can do very well in English. And I at, at work, I be talking to a client here in Spanish, and I be talking with my supplier here in English. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's that's the ingredient that has um, uh, make it possible for a lot of our community to, to really make it in this country. Mm -hmm. I would like to add to that. Um, I would like to give the military uh, perspective. Me being in the military and I was a communications officer, had the opportunity to travel throughout the world, um, and then also from academia. Uh, the thing is, is, like you said, is that being able to go back and forth. One of the things is, is that, like you're saying, in business, it's about money and it's about building relationships. So us, when we're, when we're in the military, when we travel to other countries, the first course we received was about that culture. So when I traveled to Thailand, they sat us down for three days and told us, hey, look, these are the words you need to know, and this is what's about the culture. When I pulled into to Spain, when I pulled into to Singapore, when I pulled into Thailand, to Japan, when I was stationed in Japan after two, for two years after 9-11, it was the same thing. So one of the things is, is you have to embrace that culture by at least trying to speak the language. So I think in business today, that's what, what the students are learning today. They're taking Latin American studies, uh, business courses in order for them so that they can embrace another culture by still learning some of it. So what do you say for those here in Texas that say English only? We shouldn't try to learn another language. L let, me, let me first chime in on what he was saying. Number one, there's a huge market, mm -hmm. uh, you know. When 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 you're talking about the business perspective, when we do our seminars, uh, a lot of the material that we present are who are you selling to, who are your customers, what is their language, and what do they listen to. So when 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 somebody says English only, you know you're eliminating a huge huge market out there. You know uh, we forgot to mention one thing uh, before we got started. Uh, we have a celebrity in the house right here, Mr. <laughs> Polio Costa. Mm -hmm. uh, he just came out with his new book, and forgive me, I don't know the name of the book. Uh, could you give us a, a little insight in, into your book and, and what you've learned from your experience? Well, certainly, thank you, Ben. Uh, the my my book in English is uh, is titled The Shadow Catcher, uh, and it's about the early part of my career as an immigration officer. Uh, actually infiltrating a lot of groups coming into the United States where I actually posed as an illegal immigrant and uh, uh, entered the United States uh, secretly with, uh, with groups, uh, with organizations, uh, transporting or smuggling uh, large numbers of people into the United States. Uh, the Spanish edition comes out this week. Uh, we're having our book launch this week, uh, El Cazador de Sombras. And uh, I'm proud to say, by the way, that it, it's been uh, number one in four categories in the Spanish edition this past week. Uh, uh, throughout, the, throughout the United States on Amazon.com. So how do you think your life would have been if you hadn't been bilingual? <laughs> well, well, I certainly wouldn't have been able to infiltrate any of those groups that I were <laughs> and, and be smuggled into the United States. Uh, but, but actually, there's, uh, there's something else. Well, along those lines, uh, I met a lot of people that come into the country seeking a better life, and I saw firsthand their dreams, their desires to learn English, to learn about our culture. Uh, what, what's very different about this particular book is that no agent in the history of our government has ever done that type of work uh, in, in the way that I did. So, you know, it's a, it's a very unique perspective of having lived that life. Uh, it helped a lot also that uh, I didn't learn English until I was about seven years old either. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it, it wasn't hard to do, but uh, I, I think it's a fantastic reading for people who uh, want to learn about how immigrants come into the country, the ordeals that they go through. Uh, and then when we see the success uh, of many immigrants in this country, I think it, it's, a, it's a tremendous adventure. And you're learning, if you will, while you were doing this. 
Uh, did you find that a lot of the immigrants refused to learn English because uh, they hung out with other immigrants and they worked in an environment where they didn't have to learn English? Mm -hmm. So did you find that they pretty much stuck to their own and, and didn't learn the language? You know, I actually been, uh, I got smuggled with a group 34 years ago and I stayed in contact with them and all of them are American citizens and all of them know English. Uh, the son of one of, the, one of those young ladies that was with me in the back of U-Haul is on a scholarship here at Rice University. So I think the answer itself is that they were willing to work and do whatever they needed to do. They learned English, they adjusted to the culture, and they worked very hard. Uh, so I think that that better answers your question with the example that I used of those individuals that uh, that were with me. Hey, but I think if you if you talk about the Cama de Empresarios, I think it's very important for the viewers, the people, to know the history of how the Cama started back with Cesar Rodriguez and Rafael Ortega and Mr. Camarena. Wasn't it because they were having problems with their businesses and getting representation from police officers and what have you? Give us a little bit of that history, Abel. I think that that's a, a great way point you're bringing up because we we kind of reliving the same the same issues that that uh, that brought the, these individuals to found Camara de Empresarios that it used to be called uh, Comerciantes Unidos de Houston. Uh, and uh, the name was changed in 2000 to Camara de Empresarios Latinos, but th there was 12 men and women business owners in Houston there. You know, you, you mentioned some of the names and, and you all know the, the success they have on their businesses. And at, at one time there were being uh, robbed in the stores, uh, going from the stores to the bank, going from, you know, uh, at home uh, mm -hmm. at night. And they, they, they approach um, uh, the Hispanic chamber and obviously, you know, th they're lacking on the language or they, they, they were not being comfortable with, with who they spoke to. So they felt that they were just being shut out. Uh, they went to the police. There was no, you know, you call the police one person you know, how many people is in line waiting. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality of things. Uh, and we are reliving uh, the, the same thing uh, these days. Uh, we met um, with uh, three of the vice chairs of the camera about a week ago, and we were hoping to, to, uh, to make a, a call to the, the uh, sheriff. You know, we all, you all, we all know uh, Mr. Garcia, and, and we want to reach out to... Uh, uh, the chief of police at downtown, because our businesses are being attacked on a daily basis. And unfortunately, uh, there is no, uh, we feel there is no support. We feel that, that our businesses are not being uh, looked after like they do in other communities. You know, Jose, uh, he, he brings up a, a good point. Uh, they have, in their organization, uh, they're well known uh, for being very busy, business savvy. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of very successful people in your organization. Mm -hmm. And they have catered uh, to the Hispanic community. Uh, Michoacanas, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They have catered to the Hispanic community here. And, and, and I applaud them uh, for being so successful. Uh, I'm just wondering how we can transfer their success in the Hispanic community to the American community so they can be even more successful. So it'd be interesting to see how some people can make that well, transition. I'm going to make a correction here. There, there are already successful American businesses. It, it just happened to deal with Hispanics. They're American businesses. Oh, no, I agree. I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking about and, and broadening the, their, um, their clients, if you will. Well, to uh, the English speaking world. They can be more world. successful. Because uh, yeah. really, I think we're going to go back to what you talked about here. And you're talking about being pocho. You know, and and what is happening is that in the for some people, not for everybody, in the Hispanic chamber or in the regular chambers, the Latinos that are there are not Latino enough for the Spanish speakers. True or not? I mean, there's there's situations where you look at uh, you might look at another person that happens to look Hispanic, or they might like look at you or might look at me and say, you know, you're not Mexican enough. Mm -hmm. You're you're already too Americanized, so I don't want to deal with you. So they'd rather go with somebody else who's more, you know connected in a different way, right? So culture, practice, what you live in your own community might have a big impact. I think that's what happened to the businesses. They were, the businesses, they were, there were business people working every day. They wore, you might wear t-shirts and polos to work and just worked. They weren't in suit and ties every day to go to a chamber meeting. You know, and sometimes the presentation has a big impact. But how they come more successful, I think they are successful. And, 
if you look at certain restaurants, they're already reaching out and making a, mark, a, certain, a concerted effort to reach out to the English-speaking world. Because it's really about language. A, a lot of our business, a lot of business people are, are the majority of the clients are Anglos. Let me give an example, uh, Los Cucos Mexican restaurants. If you met these two individuals, uh, they have over 20 restaurants. They own most of their buildings. And 90% of the clientele are, are uh, Anglos. Mm -hmm. And if you see restaurants in, the, in, the, in any area outside the, the loop, the majority of the clients are not Mexicans, are Anglo. I, I'm, I happen to have about over 100 restaurants insured throughout the county and out in, in throughout the state. And the majority Mexican restaurants cater to the Anglo community. There are very few you want to find in, in, inside the loop. Taqueria Arandas, mostly Hispanic clients. Uh, you want to find Donerakis. But the majority are Anglo, Anglo clients. Now, I want to I wanna point out one more, one more thing uh, that the Ben was saying. I think his point is that that there, there is a disconnect within our, our own community. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, recent immigrants and the second generation uh, Mexican Americans. Mm -hmm. and, and there is the disconnect because the culture and the level of um, academic uh, uh, knowledge, if you will, mm -hmm. there, there's, there's that disconnect. I was brought up to be a sinvergüenza. Mm -hmm. by, what I mean by that is I, have, I, I was brought up to be... Uh, you have no shame. I have <laughs> no shame to go and say, Ben Mendes, my name is Evo Sanchez, and what can we do together? But most people uh, didn't had, uh, um, had that brought, um, brought up uh, as, as I did. And basically because where we grew up in Mexico. But in here you're going to find someone like Rafael Ortega, Jose Camarena, Gelasio Torres, and I can name, you know, 20 that they will prefer uh, to deal with a non-looking, American-looking or uh, Americanized supplier, <laughs> supplier, <laughs> supplier, if you will. That's why they call me Guero. <laughs> uh, because because they, they don't feel the connection. They don't feel the connection. The comfort, level, the comfort level uh, whether it's uh, at, a, at, a, at a personal level or an academic level. Okay. So one, once you don't have that connection, it's very difficult. I mean, you just don't feel the trust. And you know business are done when you trust somebody. I mean, that's the bottom line. I'll give an example. I, I was negotiating on a piece of property, and, and the gentleman just didn't want to negotiate. And I wanted to purchase a property, and they pay six points. So I said, I call Abel. I said, Abel, you sell property? Just so he could earn the three points. I said, well, you don't want to give me anything. I'm going to make you give up half of the commission. And that's a true story, right, Abel? Just come on over and come to the closing and collect a check, just to kind of mm -hmm. give it to the other guy. But uh, comfort uh, level. You didn't call me. Hey, I'm real estate. But I want to add what, uh, to, to what Abel was uh, was talking about. I, I think we have a challenge before us because we have to we we have to bridge a gap that we have, you know, from what we call the the Chicano uh, part of our culture with the more recent. Uh, immigrants to the country because I think you know, you know, we know that the market is there for business. We also know that it's a political uh, force that can be reckoned with if we are united mm -hmm. uh, in what we do. And it starts with business because we work together. We have, you know, we we make sure that we get a better part of the market. And, and look, we don't, we not only have the Spanish market, but I think coming back to your point, we should reach out to not just a Spanish market. And I, I know I know that we certainly preach this uh, within the uh, empresarios, the whole world is our market, not just the Spanish-speaking market. It should be uh, every type of background, every type of culture. I know we're looking, we're reaching out to the uh, Asian community. We're looking, we're reaching out to other communities as well to join us. And I think we, we have a, a, uh, a, a, a bridge that we have, that we have to uh, make it better 
for our community. Awesome. And before we, before we close, mm -hmm. so I know we got we're running out of time. Uh, I want to congratulate Fidencio here. Uh, he just graduated from the National Hispanic Professional Organization Leadership Institute this past May. Yes. And so quickly, tell us about the Leadership Institute. Well, the Leadership Institute is an amazing organization to develop the, the future leadership within Houston and uh, throughout the state. Uh, it's a six-month course every other Saturday, so it's very intensive from 8 in the morning to 5 in the evening. But the beauty of it is you're receiving knowledge that sometimes you wouldn't have received on campuses or through academia. Mm -hmm. And it's first-hand uh, leadership and training from, from the leaders of, of this city. Awesome. I think it's been a great show. Uh, we're actually out of time right now, but thank you so much for joining us today. And also out there, if you consider yourself a pocho, you know, you can do something about it. Change it. Be proud of it. Learn Spanish. Learn English. Do whatever you have to do. But at the end of the day, it's really important to understand that being bilingual, bicultural is going to be important for your career and for your business and for your family. So you are watching Latino Talk TV. We'll be here next week, Monday night. Have a great night.